Well, good morning again. I just want to know how two out of those five children could never have been naughty. They obviously were not <laughs> children from my family. <laughs> they were so cute. No, we've not ever been naughty. <laughs> well, you all know that you were going to get a sermon on Job this week because if you were with me a couple weeks ago, you remember part of my story was that I spent uh, 80 hours in Job during J term. So I thought, well, geez Louise, why would I recreate the wheel if I could take some of the papers and the work I had done and roll them up into a sermon? So hopefully that's what you're going to hear today from the Spirit. So to get started, have you guys heard about the businessman from Stearns County, the really, really rich one, the wealthy one who's the business owner? But then he lost his business right after the recession. He couldn't keep it going and he went bankrupt. And then shortly thereafter, his children were in a horrible car accident and they were both killed. And then, probably due to stress, the poor guy ended up getting all these gross sores all over his body and nobody even wanted to be with him, not even his wife. But the best news about this dude that I heard is that he was still remaining faithful to God. He didn't curse God, and he still hasn't walked away from God. He's still remaining faithful, and he is waiting patiently for his revival, for his resuscitation, to be reinstated with the living, at least to get rid of the sores, if not to bring back his wealth and his family. I would say that he's got the patience of Job. Now. If you're like me, when you were a little kid, your folks had all these interesting sayings like, she's got the patience of Job, or a stitch in time saves nine. And you sort of know what they meant, but you certainly had no idea where they came from. Well, it wasn't until I got to seminary a couple years ago that I sort of put two and two together, and I figured out maybe that patience of Job thing actually came from the Bible. Maybe it was biblically related, because certainly Job did have a ton of patience. So let's do a little recap of the book of Job, because as Pastor Rick mentioned, we probably haven't been in that book for a long time. It's not one of those books when you say, I'm going to read the Bible or preach on the Bible. You grab it and you say, Oop, I'm going to pick Job. Not necessarily. So let's go back and, and talk about Job a little bit. As our scripture reader uh, indicated, Job was a very wealthy businessman, just like our friend here in Stearns County. He was prosperous, he was faithful, and he worshiped God. That is why he was so surprised and puzzled, as were his friends, when all this tragedy hit. After all, he was faithful, and he was a righteous guy, so he was really, really puzzled which is one of the major questions that folks ask, just like Job. Why do the righteous suffer? It just doesn't seem fair. Why do the righteous get punished, just like the unbelievers? Why does God's judgment tend to rain down on believers instead of unbelievers? After all, we're his chosen people. So Job and his friends were not told about a conversation that God had with Satan prior to Job's misfortunes. And we're going to read about this in just a minute in the text. But Satan and God have a conversation. Now, what I want you to understand is if you go back and dig through all the Hebrew and the Greek and the Aramaic translations, you'll find that the word Satan in this passage is not capitalized, so it doesn't have a big S, and it also has a definite article in front of the word Satan. So those of us who are teachers or retired teachers, then that tells us that Satan isn't necessarily a proper noun or a name of a particular person. So maybe it wasn't the Satan, maybe it was simply a challenger of God or an oppressor of God or somebody that might have even been a fallen angel. So let's go ahead and read in our text and read about the conversation between 
this challenger and God. And this really sets up our conversation between Job and his friends. So I'm going to be reading in Job 1, 6 through 22. And in your Bible, that is uh, page 429. So again, conversation between the challenger and God. One day, the heavenly beings came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came with them. And the Lord said to Satan, where have you come from? And Satan said, from going to and fro on earth and from walking up and down on it. And the Lord said to Satan, well, have you considered my servant Job over here? There is no one like him. He is blameless. He is righteous. He does fear the Lord. And he will always turn away from evil. Then Satan answered the Lord, Does Job fear God for nothing? Have you not put a fence around this guy? Because all of his house and everything that he has, you've blessed him, the work of his hands, his possessions, his family, and his land. But stretch out your hand now and touch what he has, and he will curse your face. Ah, the Lord said to Satan, Very well. All that he has is in your power. You can stretch out your hand against him, but you cannot harm him. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. One day, when Job's daughters and sons were eating and drinking wine in the eldest brother's house, a messenger came to Job and said, The oxen were plowing and the donkeys were feeding beside them. And the Sabians fell onto them and killed them. And all your servants were put to death. I am the only one that escaped. And while he was still speaking, another messenger came and said, The fire of God fell from heaven and burned up your sheep and all those servants. And again, I am the only one that survived. And while he was speaking, another came and said, the Chaldeans formed three columns, made a raid on the camels, and killed them, and killed all your servants that were taking care of them. I am the only one that survived. And lastly, while he was speaking, the last servant came running up and said, Your sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in your eldest son's house. And suddenly a great wind came up and great dust and it struck the four corners of the house, and it fell on all of those young people, and they are all dead. I am the only one that has survived. Then Job arose, tore his robe, shaved his head, and fell to the ground and worshipped God. And he said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return. The Lord gave and the Lord taketh away. And blessed be the name of the Lord. And in all of this, Job did not sin, nor did he charge God with any wrongdoing. Now, <clears throat> I don't know about you, but if the Lord had just taken away my wealth, my family, and put <coughs> horrific sores all over my body, I can't tell you that I still would have remained faithful in that moment. I can't tell you that I wouldn't have cursed God or at least certainly walked away from him for a period of time. I think it would have been too hard to remain faithful. Now enters the picture of Job with Job's friends. When Job's friends had heard about his misfortune, three of them rushed to him. And they sat with him for seven days in total silence. Now, I don't know about you, <clears throat> but I don't think I could be silent for seven minutes, not alone, seven days. Certainly not for seven hours, although maybe some of you guys could remain silent for seven hours, but I can guarantee you us women couldn't. I'm not sure we could remain silent for seven seconds. But his friends came they sat with him in silence for seven days to show their respect. So let's read about what happens here. So now I'm in Job 2, and I'm going to start at verse 11. I'm on page 430 in your, in your pew Bibles. 
Now, when Job's three friends heard all of these troubles and the troubles that had come upon him, each of them sent forth from his homeland, Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar. Now, those of you that are following along in my pew Bible, you'll notice that I didn't mention their last names because they're so hard to pronounce, I would have massacred their names. So we're just going to call them by their first names, Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar. They met together to go and to console and to con comfort Job. When they saw him in, from the distance, they didn't recognize him. They did not recognize him. They didn't recognize him. And they raised their voices and wept aloud. They tore their robes. They threw dust in the air upon their heads. They sat with him on the ground for seven days and seven nights. And no one spoke a word to him because they saw how great his suffering was. Now, wow, that is true friendship. Seven days and seven nights. But then things changed. I don't know if it was on the evening of the eighth day or if it was on the morning or the afternoon of the eighth day, but all of a sudden, his friends changed. They went from being friendly and consoling him and sitting in silence and just being with him to verbally attacking him because they assumed that if God's wrath had fallen this hard on him, he must have sinned. He must have been a sinner. And he must be suffering for his sin. Now, don't we kind of act this way sometimes too? You know when our friend loses her job and the minute you hear that she lost her job, you go to her house you sit with her, you console her, you talk to her, you pray for her, and you say, you know, I'm really sorry that you lost your job. And then a couple weeks later, you see her in the grocery store, and you're chit-chatting, and sure enough, she still hasn't found a job. And you say, man, you haven't found a job yet? And then another couple weeks come by, and you run into her at the corner drugstore. And uh, it's during the middle of the day, and you're assuming she's still not working, so you say to her, you know, hey, What's wrong with you? You know, well, why can't you find a job? So we go from total friendship, total being with them in consolation, to criticizing them. We go from super friends to super chumps. What, what's that about? And, and what happened to Job's friends? Were they just putting on an act those first seven days? And now their true colors are really showing? So let's do a little recap about what these friends said and how they started to console Job after they literally opened up their mouths. Well, Eliphaz is first. So he says to Job, I think you're suffering because, hey, man, you sinned. And I recommend that you go back to God, you present your case to him, and you say you're sorry and you repent. And after a couple back and forth, Job looks at him and says, hey, man, take back those accusations. I did nothing wrong. I don't know why this is happening, but I did not sin. So then Bildad, his second friend, comes up, and he ratches it up the meanness, if you would. And he says, you know, Job, you're still suffering because you're arrogant, and you can't even admit that you sinned. You know, how long are you going to let this thing go on? You've already lost your family, your wealth, and your health. You know, give up the ship. Just repent. And Job says, take back those charges. That is not true. I have not sinned. And then his third buddy, Zophar, he's a real piece of work. He comes in and he says, you know what? I don't know what you did, but you're suffering a ton. I think you ought to suffer more. I think God's being nice to you. Oh my gosh, how would you like your friend to come up to you after you lost your job and say, hey man, you deserve to lose your job. What's wrong with you? Get your act together and, and go find a different job. And Job looked at him and said, no, I am wise. Take it back. That did not happen. So then, scripture tells us, we have a fourth gentleman who enters the conversation. We don't necessarily know if he's a friend of Job or if he just happens to know Job. 
All we know about him is he is younger than the rest of the group. And he is a little confrontational to the rest of the group in their old line of thinking. So he's a little bit more accurate in what he tells Job. He says, you know, Job, you just need to be content with what you have. Even though you're suffering, you just need to buck up and take it. He says, you know, maybe God is training you or trying to teach you something during this suffering. Maybe you should just sit back and listen to God. And then Job says, you need to keep silent. You know nothing. I know all there is to know about wisdom, and I didn't do anything wrong. So in these conversations, Job is actually looking for some divine intervention. And he's telling his friends, you know, I really want to get in front of God, and I want to plead my case, because I don't think I did anything wrong. And the real question I want to ask God is, why do the righteous have to suffer? It just doesn't seem fair. But I'm going to challenge Job and say, you know what? That's the wrong question for him to be asking. The questions that Job should be asking is, what can I learn during my suffering? What is God trying to teach me during my suffering? And after all of this suffering... What can I learn about being with my friends who may also be suffering? Those are the questions that I think Job should have asked. Now, all of you guys know via my last sermon <clears throat> that I cracked a couple ribs about a month ago. But what you don't know is I cracked three ribs down the front six years ago when I was 52 skiing on Lake Coronas. You know, I thought I was hot stuff. At 52, I was still skiing on two skis, but I had learned how to drop a ski, and I thought I was so cool. So the next day, I got my whole family in the boat, and my boyfriend was driving the boat, and I was back, and I got up on two skis, and I was going to learn how to carve that day. So I had just dropped the ski, and I looked up, and it was a pure glass, beautiful day, and I don't know what happened, but man, I hit the water, and I hit it really hard. And the only thing the doctor can figure out is I landed on top the ski, because it cracked some ribs right down the front. And I don't know about you, but if you've ever cracked or broken ribs, and if you've ever knocked the wind out of you at the same time, being in the water is not the place you want to be when that happens because it was the first time that I came to appreciate a life preserver. Hey, I'm a great, great swimmer. I'm a scuba diving instructor. Most of the time, I didn't even wear a life jacket. But man, was I happy I had one on that day. Because the folks in the boat saw me go down. Well, they didn't think it was a big deal, because they didn't know what had happened. So they took their um, ever-living time just kind of putzing around and coming back to me. And when they finally got back to me, they knew I was in deep trouble. And for the next four or five days, life was not a lot of fun. I had to have friends come and stay with me because I couldn't get in and out of bed. I certainly couldn't take care of my dogs or myself. It was a really rough time. And during that time, I was not smart enough to ask those three questions. What can I learn? What is God trying to teach me? How can I take this experience and be with other folks during their suffering? Because if I would have asked those questions and been more reflective, I would have heard answers from God like, you know, you're a proud little son of a gun, young lady. We're just going to take you down a few notches. We're going to let you know what it feels like to be put in a situation where you're not really comfortable. Now you'll maybe understand while folks say to you, Jill, I just don't want to do that. I'm not in good enough shape. I'm not comfortable doing it. But nope, you keep pushing them right into it until you get them to do what you want them to do. Or maybe God would have said, you know, you think he would maybe turn to me and ask for a little help or kind of try to figure out while this was going on? But nope, not this girl, not six years ago. Well, maybe thank you to the Spirit, maybe thank you to Pastor Rick, maybe thank you to seminary, but I think I've gotten a little smarter this time. So this time when it happened, and I was laid up pretty, pretty severely for the first four or five days, 
You know, I ask myself those questions. What can I learn from this? What is God trying to teach me? And how can I use this information to be with other folks who are suffering? And you know, the sad thing is, I heard some of the, first, some of the things that I should have heard the first time around. You know, you're still a prideful young lady. All right, so I'm middle-aged. You're still a middle-aged prideful young, uh, lady. You know, maybe you can have some compassion for those elderly gals that you take to and from church all the time. Maybe you can understand what chronic pain really feels like and have some empathy for folks that have chronic pain or who are de uh, disabled or dehabilitated or aren't able to really move as well as they'd like to, especially getting in and out of bed and trying to get dressed. <laughs> Man, getting dressed was the worst. I remember my two Jack Russells would sit on the bed and they'd watch me for that half an hour it took me to get dressed. I'm sure they thought, man, you are really an imbecile. We can't believe you're our mom. <laughs> Why does it take you so long to get your socks on? So this time I was much more reflective. And I think God looks down on me this time and says, you know, way to go. At least you've learned something through this suffering. At least you aren't suffering in vain. You've been more reflective. Thank you for coming back to me and talking to me a little bit more fully through your suffering. So back to our text for just a moment. So after the conversations go back and forth with Job and his friends and the fourth guy comes in, then we get to read about the two speeches of God. And they're called wisdom speeches. And it's why Job is considered one of, one of the five wisdom books of the Old Testament because God really steps in and some people say boastfully talks but I think very clearly tells us how sovereign he is, how wise he is, and the amount of wisdom that he exudes over us. Now before he does that he clearly rebukes Job and his buddies for being prideful and for being ignorant. And I think we can learn some lessons from that, that we have to be careful not to judge others when we see them suffer. We don't know the big picture. We don't know God's plan for them. It's really our job just to pray for them and to be, for, be with them because judgment is not in our job description. It's not our job. And I think the other most important lesson that we can learn from Job is that in spite of all of his suffering, he never gave up. He never cursed God, and he never admitted to things that he did not do. And that was really the discussion between God and the Satan. The Satan said he will curse you, or he will admit to things that he has not done to get out of his predicament. And you know what? Job didn't do that. So let's go to verse 42, verse 1 through 6. And that's uh, 462 in your pew Bible. So here's what Job says after everything he's gone through, after his friends have really been pills and accused him of a lot of wrongdoings, he still says this. Then Job answered the Lord, I know that you can do all things, and that no purpose of yours is thwarted. Who is this that hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore I have uttered, and I did not understand. Things too wonderful for me, I didn't know. Hear, and I will speak. I will question you, and you will declare to me. I have heard of you by your hearing in my ear. And now my eyes can truly see you. Therefore, I despise myself, and I repent in dust and ashes. He didn't blame God. He didn't curse God. He didn't admit to wrongdoings. Just like we would hope that that is what we would do through our suffering. So, at the end of the story, God does restore Job to a place even greater than he was before. More wealth, more family, more money, more prestige. But you know, God didn't have to do that to justify his actions. I think he did that simply because he's a compassionate God. 
and he continues to show us grace. So, I want you to spend a minute this morning thinking about a time that you were suffering greatly, whether it's emotionally, physically, mentally, psychologically, whatever. Or maybe it's a time that you're going through right now in great suffering. So just take a second to, to get that up into the forefront of your brain to really think about when you were suffering and how you felt. Okay, if you've got it up in the forefront, what I want you to do is keep it there. And after you leave here this afternoon when the kids are down for the nap or it's nap time for your spouse or maybe it's this evening and you get the kids down, I want you to think about that time of suffering. And I want you to re be reflective. And I want you to go back and I want you to ask yourself three questions. What is God trying to teach me during this time of suffering? What am I supposed to be learning during this time of suffering? And thirdly, how can I take this time of suffering and learn from it to be with other folks during their time of suffering? Because if you're able to answer those questions in a reflective moment, your suffering won't be for vain or won't be for going in vain either. You'll begin to just receive a glimpse of that message that God is trying to portray to you during your time of suffering. And your message is personal. It's going to be different than mine. Jane's is different than Rick's, which is different than mine, which is different than yours. But truly there has got to be some lesson in there. And then we want to remember Job's last words. I know that you can do all things because no plan of yours can be thwarted. That, my friends, is faith. And remember the definition of faith. Faith is believing in things that you have not seen. So even though some of us may suffer greatly in this world, whether we're believers or unbelievers, we do know that those of us who believe in Jesus Christ and what he did for us on the cross, we know that when we go to heaven, we will receive new bodies and we will no longer be suffering. With that, let us pray. Dear Lord, please allow us as we grow in faith with you to be more reflective, and when we're suffering, to not be judgmental, but to open our hearts and our minds to finding the answers to those questions. What can I be learning during this time? What is God trying to teach me? And thirdly, how can I be close to 